good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Testy from the Law School Mission Council, and it's my great pleasure with my co-host, Ken Randall from iLaw, to welcome you to this month's show of Live with Kelly and Ken. We're really happy you joined us today, and uh, we want to first say that our hearts go out to everyone who's been so deeply affected by the COVID crisis, and we hope that everyone's remaining as well and safe and sane as possible during this unprecedented time. I uh, know that this week's topic is one that really has such salience for us right now as everyone has moved quickly to take their education into uh, the online format out of emergency and necessity, but out of that also comes opportunity for advancement and learning. And so we thought it would be helpful during this month's show uh, to focus on this topic and to focus on strategizing and uh, how to think about distance education at a time of uncertainty and then also, of course, going into the fall. So I'm really happy to welcome you here. And as usual, what we'll do is we'll begin by introducing our four panelists and uh, then I'll turn it to my co-host, Ken, for some questions to them. And then I'll be monitoring the audience Q&A so that we can interject some questions from you as we go forward and make this as useful as we can to our audience. So let me begin by welcoming our panel. And I wanna say a warm welcome to Chancellor John Pierre. Uh, John, we're so happy you can join us from Southern University Law Center. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. My pleasure and uh, also very happy to welcome Dean Darby Dickerson uh, from the University of Illinois, Chicago, the John Marshall School of Law. And uh, Darby's also serving this year as the president of uh, AALS, the Association of American Law Schools. Darby, we're really happy to have you with us. Welcome. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Erin O'Connor joins us from Florida State University College of Law, she, where she is the dean. And Erin, uh, it's so good to have you with us. And welcome from, uh, from sunny Florida. Thank you, Kelly. Happy Monday. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And I'm uh, very delighted to welcome uh, my good friend, Dean Megan Carpenter from the University of New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce School of Law. Uh, Megan, you've been a great leader for us in this area and we welcome you and glad you could join us today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. You bet. Uh, I wanna thank all the deans for joining us. Uh, as you all know, deans have their hands full this time of year and so, uh, to each of the four deans, I say a really big thanks from, uh, from me and from Ken. And Ken, with that, it's always a pleasure to host this with you. Let me turn it to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And you know, welcome to everybody. Deans, we appreciate your time. And to our audience, as Kelly said, we hope you are well and safe. And our thoughts go out to everyone who is facing challenges at this time. Um, I want to start by asking each of the deans to tell us a little bit about the decision-making process that's going on on your campus regarding not really just the summer, because I think people are pretty much off campus for the summer, but for the 2021 academic year. And I know, you know, one of the challenges is that there's uncertainty. Uh, each of you is in a different state, different campus, different epidemic in your area. But we also know that there's contingency planning going on because we don't know what's going to happen by August. So if you can tell me about the status of the decision making, what the timetable, how a role, the role that the law school has interacting with campus. And Darby, I'm going to start with you if I can. Sure. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ken. Um, we're part of a large public university. I'm fortunate to have a provost who is a former law dean. So she's actually giving the law school a lot of autonomy. Um, both because of our accreditation status and because we're in a separate part of town with our own buildings. Um, I'm hoping, we actually are running a very robust summer program that will start in a couple of weeks. So we just finished the planning for that and are now turning to fall. And I've been thinking about different contingencies, like you said. I've been meeting with a lot of my senior leadership. Today we had a faculty meeting where we rolled out some big priorities and goals to the faculty. We're getting ready as soon as final exams are over to have debrief sessions with faculty and students about what worked in the spring and what didn't work. And we hope to have our planning done no later than the end of May on this. 
we are thinking that because we're in Chicago, we won't be fully online, I mean, fully on campus, but we are striving to have blended um, courses, particularly for our 1L students. We want to make sure that they are integrated into the law school community, and we also want to be able to hold portions of as many experiential courses as we can on campus. So we're busily trying to figure out what social distancing means in a 12-story vertical building. But right now we're gathering information about which faculty are going to be willing and able to return in person. We're going to be surveying our admitted and deposited students because we know everyone's going to be in a different situation and we understand that some people are going to need to be remote the entire semester. So whatever we decide for specific classes, we want to make sure that we accommodate all of our faculty and all of our students, even if it's synchronous. Great. Thank you, Darby. Just one, one follow-up question for you. Does a law school have any discretion in going its own way, or is it pretty much set by what the campus is going to uh, do? We're going to be doing something uh, a bit different. The, the university has asked that we all attempt to go blended, uh, because that is what has, has come down, but we can design that our own way. And the provost has also indicated that we need to see what our faculty and students both need and want. So. We, we have been given the ability to design our entire program on our own, just with that big parameter to shoot for, to at least have some blended components. Great, thank you. John, I'm gonna to turn to you. You're in Louisiana and it's a state that has been one of the hard hit states and we'd love to hear about your planning process. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, unfortunately, Louisiana is uh, definitely one of the hot spots and, uh, the challenges we face really require us to think deeply about what the fall semester will look like. As being part of a system, the Southern University system, we have begun to start having the conversations. We haven't made any final decisions uh, because the Southern University Law Center is located on what we call the Baton Rouge landmass. We might have to do some things differently than the main campus will do uh, as it relates to our students. We were very successful this spring with our virtual environment. And of course, you know, we have been able to do some things through our law with respect to online. So we're clearly interested in a hybrid form and we would be prepared because we keep hearing about the second and third wave to go virtual, all virtual if we need to. And that's the real key. We have to be prepared to do things if we need to. So you have really contingency planning with different avenues depending on what's going on in August? Yes. And basically next week, we're going to final exams this week, but next week we'll start having those discussions with the faculty to be able to determine what are the best options we ought to at least pursue. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Erin, what's going on at FSU? I uh, think you can. Uh, so we too are looking at a hybrid model right now. We have a strong preference on our faculty for in-person education. Uh, and so we're planning for in-person education with a synchronous backup as our norm. Um, but we know that there'll be some faculty and some students who need accommodations, who won't uh, feel comfortable coming to campus, uh, who, who may be sick. And so we are uh, getting ready for the conversation with our faculty about what that backup plan should look like? Is the backup plan asynchronous courses or some combination of asynchronous and synchronous courses? Yeah. Erin, thanks. Um, you know, there's a technology called lecture capture, which has now, you know, advanced in a couple of different iterations where you can have a residential classroom, but then students also can watch or participate remotely. Uh, any thought given to that, particularly for students who may need to stay away from campus? Yeah, we're, 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 we're turning to that now. We're also turning to, for all of our students, to try to think more creatively about how to use some of the techniques that are available in the synchronous environment and the asynchronous environment, from discussion boards to breakout rooms, just ways to bring our off-campus off students uh, together with on-campus students, even for the in-person classes. Yeah, thank you. So Megan, I saved you for last, uh, and you'll also be the first person to answer the next question that I have, but I saved you for last because, you know, I know at UNH Franklin Pierce, 
you have an online program already that, you know, you have a variance for, so you have both residential and online. So is the planning different on your campus because of that? Uh, you know, it, I have been saying that um, one of the easiest things for us to do in, in this transition to um, this semester to emergency on online instruction has been really to mirror the, um, the law school operations on, in an online way because we already, having developed a hybrid program where our students are, are mostly online and then they, they come to campus four times a year for a long weekend, um, we've already had to demonstrate to the ABA that we could offer parity of student services and the student experience in an online format. So kind of the infrastructure of the law school was able to be provided to students online already. And, and so that has been uh, relatively seamless. One of the distinctions I do want to make, though, is between kind of emergency remote and online instruction and then kind of thoughtful online strategic pedagogy. Um, and so that's something that we really, um, it, as we think about our planning for the fall, um, we want to include the kinds of engage, student engagement opportunities that, um, that we do in the hybrid program for, for all of our students, including any online experience we would have in the fall. Now, we, we really are pretty fortunate here in, in New Hampshire for a couple of reasons. Our law school is um, not located in the same place as our university. So we have a much smaller student body and no residence halls. Um, so we have some different, we have definitely have some different considerations when we think about moving to face-to-face -to -face instruction. And we are planning on face-to-face -face instruction, um, but we're also planning on kind of a spectrum here of, you know, on one end, thinking about we're doing an audit of all of our classrooms to see how many students fit in each classroom with, social, with appropriate physical distancing and, um, and planning on, you know, as Erin as mentioned, planning on a synchronous backup for every face-to-face -face class so that students who aren't able to attend would, would be able to do so. Um, we're also working very closely with the state and the hospital system um, to talk about things like testing, both diagnostic testing and antibody testing, um, which we expect to be, to be implementing as, as well. Um, but I do think that the, the hybrid program in particular has kind of given us that, that backup so that we feel confident in our contingency planning sort of in the full spectrum of face-to-face -to, -face to, um, to, to online instruction. Great, thank you. So when deans think about these issues, you know, we necessarily have to think about the rules, right? The accreditation rules. And for law schools, we have a single accreditor which is the American Bar Association, which has one standard that regulates distance education, standard 306, which basically allows one third of all education to be delivered online, including 10 credits in the first year. So when law schools went online this spring, we were about two thirds through the semester. So in a sense, we stayed within uh, the ABA. Some states like New York may have additional regulations. You know, Megan, um, what do we need to do with accreditation rules? What should be done? You know, how do we utilize standard 306 in an age of, of COVID and going online? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I think is true of, um, it's true in so many different ways that, that in times that are particularly challenging, it also can be an opportunity for innovation. So I think, you know, I think we see that in, in when it comes to art and music and so many different areas. But um, here in this situation, I, I think we have seen a gradual opening up of, of 306 over the years. And so right now, you know, where we're in a situation where we're all doing online instruction and legal education, I suspect that, um, you know, whether it makes us comfortable or not, as educators and as learners, it's something we're experimenting with. And so I anticipate a greater opening up and a recognition, and this is, this is something that's key to me. Online education is not just a delivery mechanism. It's not like you do face-to-face -face or you do something online. I've noticed things when I teach online that I can do with my students that are intimate, engaged learning experiences that are 
different than the kinds of intimate and engaged learning experiences that I have face to face. It's not an either or, it's an and. And so I hope that with um, the ABA and, and as these standards evolve, I hope that they will evolve to recognize that technology is just one pedagogical tool. It's not a replacement um, for the, 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 the methods of instruction that we've used in the past. Yeah, thank you. The, the great, great insights. And, you know, one of the ways it's been regulated to date really has been by what is the quantity that can be shown online. And in some ways that, of course, is superficial. Darby, you've done a lot of ABA work. And as Kelly said, you know, you're the president of the American Association of Law Schools. Um, give us some insights, if you can, about accreditation standards and what you think we ought to be doing with regard to 306, either now or going forward. I agree with Megan. I, I think that Bill Adams, who is the new managing director of the ABA, has been really willing to work with law schools, uh, really willing to be a good ambassador from the deans to his council. And I'm fortunate to be right down the street from him, so he certainly knows the situation in Chicago. And I've been talking to him uh, about that, about what do we do and when can you give us an answer? Because we can design programs uh, that we think this would work well in our environment but I think most schools are going to need to use more distance education than they have in the past. And we have been offering at my school online degrees and courses since 2009. So I'm sure I already have students who've maxed out if we were just left to regular 306. Right. So I think that the ABA has been um, very open and working with us. And I think all the schools are monitoring this. We've been asked to wait until the council meeting in May. Um, but I think a lot of us are poised to go in and ask for a variance, whether it be to um, offer more of the program online to get a temporary raise of the cap of 30 or of the first year camp cap of 10, or to make sure that we're able to offer that backup synchronous option to any student who needs it because of illness. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. And it's not, it's on my list and it's high on my list, but it's not at the highest because I think all the creditors approve that they came around and were, were very um, reasonable with us this time around. Um, so I, I also agree with Megan that I think we're going to just see the caps raise gradually over time, whether we'll get to 100% in our appeal, I don't know. Uh, Megan is a guinea pig in that, in that area, but I think they're going to increase and I'm really starting to focus more on how can we have more consistency in what we offer in the fall instead of giving the faculty like 10 options, here are the two. How can we use the feedback from our students and faculty in particular to make this an excellent experience going forward? Yeah, great. Thank you, Darby. Erin, I'm going to shift a little bit here. And, and, and I know you're, you've been an online teacher. You teach online in the summers. Um, and, you know, faculty did a great job getting their course, their teaching online quickly. But what most people would tell you is that faculty with Zoom or WebEx or something are teaching their courses remotely, but that's different from creating an online course, right? It, teaching an online course is very deliberative. It's by design. There's great learning science. You know, there've been decades spent improving it. So um, if we're gonna do some online in the fall, is it time to create online content as opposed to teaching just remotely? So that, that's one of the things that we're working on at Florida State is to um, create pieces of what you would see in an online environment, even to be used even in an in-person um, uh, setting. Um, and I think it should enrich the in-person curriculum, but also uh, make it easier and, and, and enable us to provide a higher quality curriculum next year, regardless of, of what ultimately happens. Um, but I mean, I agree with Megan. Uh, my experience teaching online has been such that I think I think my students learn more when they take a course from me online than they do in an in-person setting because there's just so many different tools that we can use to ensure that the students are understanding the material and applying it richly to different types of problems. Great, thank you. And I know we have some questions coming in and I want to get to some of them. I know we've, we've seen some, but I want to just uh, turn to John Pierre and, and again shift it somewhat. There's so much to talk about. So we can talk about doing things remotely when it comes to the classroom. 
but we also know that there's a full range of student services that we provide. So what do we do or what is your law school doing to provide those kinds of services, whether it's academic support, bar prep, employment, uh, which again goes beyond just what we're doing in the classroom? Sure. So actually the way we actually began uh, preparing ourselves for the virtual environment is through bar prep. We started doing uh, bar prep in a virtual way, what we would call our uh, bar supplement. Uh, and we started using a lot of the tools to supplement what Barbary did and what Kaplan did for our students. And we have a very intense academic support programs because we pride ourselves on saying that we are a school of access and opportunity. We're going to take students that uh, based upon the LSAT scores are not gonna be in the top tier of LSAT scores, but we're very successful in turning them into lawyers that go out and serve the people. So they become people's lawyers. So we're going to redouble our efforts in terms of academic support. We're gonna increase the support we give. We are very, very uh, intimately involved with employment opportunities and career services. I work very closely with the career services officer in that, in that respect, academic counseling is extremely important and bar prep is extremely important. In fact, we just are going to roll out what we call our early bird bar prep program next weekend. So all of those things have to be brought in because we have to create an ecosystem. And I, I wanna congratulate my law librarian that brought us all uh, into eBooks last year. So we went all our first year students having ebooks and we're rolling into it. Now we're being offered the ebook option, which allows us to do some things. And most recently, the Southern University System Board of Supervisors allowed us to put in a program where all of our incoming first year students are going to get iPads. So all of those things are important to create that ecosystem that allows for students to learn because we are seeing that for some students, it's a challenge in the virtual environment to be the most effective student that they can be. Yeah. Good, thank you. You brought some great issues. Thank you, John. Uh, Megan, I think you saw a, a question come up on chat that you wanted to address. Yeah, there was a question. I wanna address every single one of them, but I promise I won't. Um, uh, so the, there was a question from a participant asking if I could expand more on the intimate engaged learning experiences um, that I, I've seen us able to accomplish through online that are different from our residential um, in face-to-face -face instruction. And so just to, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, one would be um, where um, we have, um, for example, office hours. So. I have office hours where I meet individually with students, and that's been great both in face-to-face -face instruction and in online instruction. But for the online class that I was teaching this past year, I also had um, group office hours that I set up at a time zone that worked for, for lots of people. So, you know, say nine or 10 people would show up in office hours, and it's something I've never done face-to-face. -face. I think I would like to do that too, but all of a sudden, in a Zoom meeting like this, you know, we're all sitting there and one person asks a question and then another student builds on that question and another student. And so there's this really sort of group learning experience that happens using technology um, that I hadn't been able to accomplish before. Another example is, um, you know, when I'm teaching in a face-to-face, we kind of are lecturing for a while and then maybe we ask a hypothetical and I'll ask three or four students. And once they kind of three or four get it, I'm imputing that knowledge onto the rest of the class, no matter you know, how big the class is. But in an online environment where you have a discussion board hypothetical and each student is answering, sort of analyzing the hypothetical before they get to see others' responses. And then they're doing that every week. I get to know in a very intimate way, the way that that student analyzes a legal issue. And I can see their writing develop and their, their ability to develop legal analysis um, over the course of time. And through that evolution, you really have a very, you develop an engaged and intimate knowledge of the individual student's abilities um, and to 
um, real, sort of to, to develop that relationship and to grade them sort of as they go along in, in each way. So there are techniques that I will, that I have brought back to the residential classroom that I've learned in the online classroom um, that incorporate um, hybrid learning technology. So I just think it's a very interesting, um, there are tools that we can use in new ways that it doesn't present an either or situation. No, absolutely. And I remember when years ago we started some academic support teaching and I thought that what we learned in teaching academic support programs, we also brought to the traditional classroom. So there's some great overlap. Um, Aaron, again, since you taught online, I want to ask you a question that I got asked today and I'm not sure I had a great answer, but when you teach online and you've had hundreds of students, um, do you think that the online education is as good for all students? Are there different student cohorts who do better online depending on like incoming backgrounds or do you think that you can make online work really for all students? Yeah, I, I, th I think online can work for all students. I, I, I find that my, my, my impression, for example, is that the superstar students are going to be superstars regardless of the environment that you're in. Um, but the, the kind of assessments and the kind of feedback and give and take that Megan is talking about, I think really helps the struggling student. Um, in, in our online courses, in the asynchronous setting, students have to check in three times a week with me. And in that environment, there's no place to hide. And so for students who maybe haven't performed well academically and therefore want to avoid the academic environment or minimize it, they can do that in the, in the online setting. And to me, that, that, that makes a, a huge difference. Um, I, I, I don't know if students are particularly disadvantaged. Um, one, one really important thing too about the online setting is um, there are many, many opportunities for the student who's shy to nevertheless engage, um, either engage with one other student or engage with the faculty member. And so, whereas the classroom setting, you may have someone who never raises their hand the entire semester. Um, so I, I can't really think of a, of a student who's disadvantaged in that setting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, for both synchronous and asynchronous teaching, I've heard it also said that it's democratizing, that students are, more willing at times to say things that might not be popular that they would feel you know more difficult to say in person so we really broaden the conversation i want to move a little bit now to admissions and my co-host kelly has been such a great leader in this field uh in a matter of months got a whole new platform uh the lsat flex up so kelly we're all indebted to you and of what you've done and I want to ask just a couple of the deans what you're seeing in the admissions process. You know, for the LSAT that's occurring this month, the next month is probably more for the fall of 2021 than for 20. But Darby, we'll start with you. And what are you hearing from applicants and what are their questions and concerns? Yeah, on the in-person versus online, we're getting questions both ways. Some people are not as comfortable thinking about coming back at this point. So they want to know if they're online options. We have a lot of people who are very excited to be in the building. That's why we're looking at that blended model. Um, we find that a lot of students are taking a bit longer to make decisions just because there is so much uncertainty and we're trying to work with them in that regard. We're also running into many students who are having trouble paying the deposits because they've been furloughed or, or laid off. And we know that they'll be able to fund the legal education um, but they don't have the, the upfront money right now. And again, we're trying to um, reach out and work with those students. And finally, they want to engage. So I know we, like a lot of schools, are building a whole series of online events and activities, both to let them learn more about us, but to really start digging into the law and learning about law school and what the law is all about. That's great. Thank you, Darby. Yeah, schools have been so creative during this admissions process. I, I heard of one law school that was actually doing two sessions a day for all of their admitted students, one at noon and one at the end of the afternoon, sort of a cocktail hour, I guess. John, tell us about admissions at Southern and what you're seeing and what applicants are asking you. Yeah, so we're, we're having a very robust admission season. I, I, I looked at our trends for the last three years and we're up on all things, applicants, uh, admission seat deposits, I'm fortunate that I have a very hard working admissions committee. 
uh, a great admissions uh, director, uh, a wonderful uh, recruiter. I mean, I've got wonderful recruiters and, and I've got people who are working with me in terms of messaging, uh, in terms of getting our word out that are just helping us really create a space where folks feel comfortable. So we do have virtual fireside chats with students. And we also work with students to helping them prepare for the LSAT. And I, uh, Kelly, I wanna thank you and your staff for working with Professor Mike Gerard because students were concerned about the LSAT flex and uh, the transition from that. So we've been able to help them understand what that's about. And they are looking forward to that exam in May. Um, and we're still making decisions uh, up until July because traditionally, basically because of the nature of our students and where they're coming from first generation, they take the LSAT exam later anyway. So they'll be taking it in May and in June and we'll be making decisions up until July. Great, thank you. So both of you are really saying that you're being creative, but you, you're being nimble because the process is probably going to be delayed. The timeline is expanded and we have to be sensitive to the needs of the applicants. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Eric, I want to ask about sort of on the other side of legal education, which is, uh, uh, well, we could say both bar pass and employment. Why don't you tell us what's going on with employment? What are you hearing about summer clerkships for students? Are there internship opportunities? What's the school doing? And then for the three L's who would expect to be taking a bar this summer and hopefully having a job this fall. Yes, I, I think some of our students have lost their summer opportunities. Um, most of our graduating 3L students who secured employment uh, are retaining that employment so far. Uh, some are being asked to start later. Um, our externships, uh, that is any work for credit, the university is requiring those to be with remote with some very, very rare exceptions. Um, and so employers, uh, in, most employers are still using our students in externships, but figuring out how to make the work, uh, make the experience a remote one. Um, we're very worried about what the job market is going to look like for our graduating students who have not yet secured employment. I'm not hearing about a lot of law firms hiring right now. So we have a fairly robust uh, group of career mentors, um, several hundred graduates who help our, uh, gra our 3Ls um, secure employment. So we're working with them to try to find all the opportunities that we can we're fortunate to be in Tallahassee, the state capital, and so we're working with some of the state departments who um, suddenly find that they need assistance and might not even have a budget to pay, but we have eager students um, or young graduates who are willing to start out unpaid. So the Department of Health, for example, um, the Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, and then for our students at the law school, we're, uh, we've expanded our clinics. We're providing more clinical opportunity. We're working on a couple of pop-up clinics that we can provide um, and then working with students. Uh, students kind of roll in summer courses um, and, and students who take a robust summer offering uh, can graduate early. So we're working with some of our, our uh, rising 2Ls and 3Ls uh, with summer curriculum in, in lieu of working. Wow, that's a lot. So the busy job of the dean only got busier this spring with new. Uh, Megan, tell us about employment. And, and it's interesting because, again, you have a, an online program where you've had to think about opportunities for students in a variety of locations. How are you addressing some of the employment needs of the students today? Employment is something that we really pride ourselves on in general. So if we're calculating our employment correctly for the most recent graduating class, um, we're at 96.7%, which is not, not law school funded, but just jobs on the open market. So that's a point of, that is in general, a point of pride for us. Um, so it's something that we're particular, we're thinking very carefully about. Similar to um, what Aaron just said, we're, we have, we're expanding our clinical opportunities for students and working with the SBDC, the local SBDC, to provide assistance to small businesses this summer um, and fall and then spring of 2021 to small businesses that have been impacted by, um, by COVID-19. So that provides kind of a service to, to the state as well. We also have had a, a top ranked IP program, intellectual property over the past almost 30 years. And so we've created an intellectual 
Intellectual Property Summer Institute that we used to host um, a nationwide kind of program in the summer that people would come to. Well, this, this year we realized that um, it could be an opportunity to use our global network to have some of our um, you know, alumni kind of teach um, whether it's the head of IP at, you know, Microsoft or Pepsi or Bayer or whatever, they can come in and teach and our, our current students and offer a virtual summer experience for our students and then also for students um, across the country. So we're offering a special uh, service to any law student who graduates in 2020 whose bar exam might be delayed that for $50 a credit, um, you know, the equivalent of $50 a credit, they can enroll in, in classes to kind of upskill their resume while they're looking for a job in a tough market. Um, then the third thing that we did is to email all of our alumni and just said, hey, if there's something that you're looking, if you have a project you'd like to bring somebody on to do, this is a tough market, we'd love for you to help out our graduates. And within you know, the first 20 minutes, we had emails from you know, a dozen different alumni coming up with, with looking at this as an opportunity to bring people on even on a short-term basis. So, um, so I, I would say those are sort of the three actions we've been taking so far. Yeah, fabulous, just really leveraging all the great resources you have. Kelly, I know that we're getting questions from the audience and uh, why don't I turn it over to you? Okay, Ken, thank you. And uh, thanks uh, for your nice comments too about the LSAT flex where we had so many uh, candidates sign up today. So we are just always eager to help the candidates continue their enrollment journey, whether for this fall or for next fall. And so please, if any, or any candidates are on, know that we're there for you. We have weekly candidate webinars too. And uh, so look at lsac.org. We have another one this Wednesday where we'll answer a lot of questions about the enrollment journey and LSAT Flex. Um, but I wanna come back in. There are a number of questions from the audience around faculty. I think there are a lot of associate deans on today. And of course, the deans often charge them with helping make sure to marshal all the faculty resources and to get that curriculum covered. And so some people are asking about, you know, how do you motivate the faculty uh, to work on these new types of courses? You know, so how are you supporting the faculty in doing that work? And then the other question that's related, and I'll throw them both out and then ask each of you to comment on either or both of those. The other question is, what about faculty who might be especially vulnerable to illness? And if you're having a blended where some people are teaching in the in-house and others online. How do you wrap your planning around that in case there are some faculty that may not be comfortable coming in? So um, let me uh, start with Aaron and just ask for any comments on how you're managing uh, faculty resources in this time. So the faculty question's not easy for us in the sense that we have a very, very strong preference for in-person instruction at Florida State. So it's, it's been a journey. Um, when I asked our faculty to come for Zoom training in anticipation of the possibility we would end up having to go remote for the rest of the semester, virtually every full-time faculty member showed up, but they weren't all happy to engage in a training process. Um, but we had some time and I think our faculty did fairly well. So in anticipation of the summer being remote, we offered another session working on breakout rooms um, and then simultaneously I've had my faculty focused on uh, formative assessments because I don't really think we've had as rich a set of formative assessments as we probably should for, for ABA guidelines. And so because we've had a series of a couple of times every semester faculty would talk about formative assessments they're doing, we're now shifting over the summer to using the online tools for formative assessments and really just trying to challenge faculty to come up with ideas that will be translatable back to the in-person, uh, full in time in-person uh, classroom. But it's, um, it's, it's a little bites um, for us. Uh, I, um, I know there'll come a time at the beginning of July when we'll have to make some big decisions if the university decides we can't meet in person and, and it'll, it'll be hard, um, but hopefully we've taken enough small bites along the way so that um, it's not an, an insurmountable hurdle when we get there. Thanks, Aaron. that's really, really helpful. And uh, John, I'd, I'd be curious on your, uh, how you're experiencing the faculty support angle there what are what are you guys doing to help your faculty likewise we actually took a week off 
uh, to get everybody accustomed to the Zoom technology, which we had already incorporated into our system. So we just simply said, this is how we're going to do it. The, the big question was the issue about making sure that we could accommodate based upon the size of the classes. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to look to, particularly when it re relates to how we go forward is we might use more team teaching that might help in terms of being able to make sure, because sometimes some people aren't as comfortable with the technology and if they run into a little glitch, uh, it presents a, a certain level of frustration. But I can say that our faculty has been wonderful and some of them now really see the benefit of being able to have that virtual environment in a synchronous way. I think, I think they're more fans of synchronous, although there are a few fans of asynchronous. The, the other, I think, really big issue we have to be able to think about is unfortunately, because of the potential impending budget cuts uh, for state institutions like Louis, in, in Louisiana, where the price of oil has dropped, we're gonna have to think about how to be very creative in the fall to be able to keep people engaged in ways that we make sure that they understand the value of making sure that we work together collaboratively from a team perspective. So there, there are gonna be some significant changes, but I have found that our faculty, when faced with challenges, and they've had many before, uh, rise to the occasion. They sure do, John. You guys do a great job, and uh, we all applaud your mission and, uh, and creativity. I, uh, Megan, I want to turn this to you for any comment, and, uh, and as I do so, I also want to invite one other thought, which is, you know, we're talking a lot about the teaching part of the faculty role, but there's also the scholarship and service point, too. So also any, any pointers on how to keep those parts engaged while we all go through this? Thanks, Kelly. Um, I, you know, just I, this, this afternoon, we had a brainstorming session um, with our faculty to talk about, you know, some of the things that um, as we think about planning for kind of a thoughtful pedagogical hybrid approach going forward um, through our contingency planning process, you know, what their, their ideas are and what their thoughts are because they, um, you know, sort of treating it as, as a brain trust. And I think that might be you know, sometimes I think when, when leaders, you can just sort of put your head down and you feel like the work goes on 24 seven and, and you're doing your best to kind of advocate on behalf of your faculty in the law school. But um, it's really important to kind of put your head up and remember and communicate out and make sure that you're um, also seeking input from, from others. And so we had one of those sessions today. We're also um, putting out a survey in the next couple of days to get faculty input on what kinds of support we can provide them going forward. Um, the kind of support that we did provide them through Zoom training and making sure their classes are all up in our learning management system, all of that was very mechanical. Um, we had an instructional designer involved, but, but I want it more to be instructional designer focused and, and as we go into the summer and planning going forward, um, the, the mechanical training will kind of give way to another kind of training and support. And so um, we're, we're just in the process right now of figuring out where the pain points are, both for students and faculty, and where the surprises, the happy surprises have been, and how we can help support those going forward. That's great. Thank you so much. And Darby, I'd like to get your voice in on this too, about faculty uh, uh, relations and aspects to this uh, issue. And one other point that's come up here just uh, in the meanwhile is uh, is terms of faculty protection. If you are having some people in the building, are you guys also planning for the ways to uh, comply with all the sanitation uh, and other health directives that are coming out? Yeah, so on the first question about faculty, one thing that the deans at the university had a discussion about last week is that faculty who aren't going to be teaching summer school are all of a sudden going to go from a period of having this intense interaction, although 
um, online to being solitary. So we're in the process of developing an entire summer engagement series for faculty and one of my associate deans is planning some ideas that we'll then throw out and, and um, get the faculty input on, but that might be some works in progress to keep the scholarship ideas going, some teaching tips to get people continue to focus on fall, and then some more informal things just to continue to build relationships. On the question about that's asked in, in the Q&A, um, what we're thinking about for the fall is, is a few layers to it. First, we've done a survey of the faculty. We're not gonna force any faculty to come back into the building who aren't ready. So that means we're gonna to have to reshuffle the, the sections as we envision them. But we also know that you can't bring 80 or 90 people and have them fit in any of our classrooms. I doubt many of us have that. So we're looking at breaking each section into subsections of 20 to 30. Within that, it could be that one of those is completely synchronous for people in that section who aren't comfortable coming in. But the people who come in, we're limiting the days that any section will be on campus. We're modeling one day and we're modeling two days. Um, the students will go to, in a sec subsection, will go to a single classroom. They will stay in that classroom the entire time. The faculty member will change out and will come in and clean down the lectern area. That will allow us to clean only at the end of day, but we're also going to up the um, wipes and disinfectants and hand sanitizers so people can clean their areas um, as, they, as they go through the day. We're probably also going to have chairs like marked where you can sit and have a side seating so you actually have your own area. We're also thinking about how do you keep people from congregating when they leave. We can control them coming in because we can put those hash marks and say, okay, you can come in and go up the elevator. But what about the leaving? Um, so we have people coming in one door, leaving the others. We're going to have stairwells marked for up and down. Um, we, we also, we were just talking about this today and we're going to have to get some student feedback. We're thinking about asking people to bring brown bag lunches so that they can stay in that general area, even though we have a, a cap, self-serve cafe and things like that. So for people who need it, they could leave, but it wouldn't be 20 people getting in the, the classroom. So this is why we're going to have to limit the classes we can bring in because you can't, you have to think about that cleaning. So that's one way we've thought about it is when one subsection comes in, maybe for a six hour day, we clean only the front as for the professor, then we clean at the end of the day, and then another subsection could come into that large room the next day. It's really helpful, Darby. This, I think, falls into the category of other duties as assigned for the <laughs> dean, right? <laughs> it's a big puzzle for sure. It really is. Erin, uh, I know you uh, do so much with faculty research. I wanted to get your thought on that aspect of supporting faculty through this. So the, the Zoom environment has created a lot of fun opportunities at the law school. Um, we have a summer brown bag series, for example, where once a week a faculty member presents a work in progress. And what we've done this summer is we've asked the presenter to think about a handful at least of um, individual scholars from other law schools or other parts of the university to join that Zoom group. And I think that'll enrich um, uh, the particular environment. But there, there's also popping up across the country a lot of uh, little groups, whether it's evidence law or constitutional law, uh, groups of scholars who are beginning to meet once a week to present papers to one another. And if you think about you know, something as simple as it's very difficult to travel to Tallahassee. You can't fly direct from just about anywhere to Tallahassee. This Zoom world has opened up, I think, for us, um, a wealth of opportunities that I hope we call on even after we get past the COVID-19 crisis. That's great. I, uh, Ken, I think what I'm going to do is turn this back to you with, uh, with one question that's come in, and then I think maybe you can get the closing comments from each panelist. But one of the things that's come in is people are really hungry for more resources on online learning. You know, they're both faculty members who are hoping to learn more about how to design and to uh, do well in this environment. Associate deans looking for help in motivating and giving resources to their faculty. And I know some universities have wonderful teaching and learning centers where there's a lot of help there and there's a lot on uh, online that some of those universities have posted, but others have less access to that. So I might ask you to address, you know, where do you go for more resources and then uh, go ahead and take it from here with getting our closing comments today. Yeah, you know, thank you, Kelly, and I'd be happy to. So uh, not to be self-serving, but ILAW does 
online education. And in this spring, we really did offer services to law schools to train faculty. We did webinars. Uh, and even for a few law schools that didn't have Zoom or a platform, we made our platform available and will continue to be you know, accessible to law schools throughout the summer. You know, part of the question is going to be, are schools really doing something more than the remote teaching or are they moving to a more asynchronous platform? But again, I law and we'll, I'll be sure that we have on our website a variety of resources that faculties can use. But uh, it's going to be an interesting summer getting ready for the fall. Kelly, I'm going to close in and ask each dean for some closing remarks. And I'll tell you something that I'm interested in, but you know, feel free to vary and talk about something else. Um, I'm interested in what you think this spring means for the future of online education. Uh, does this mean that law schools are going to be more receptive even when they're not challenged with uh, a situation like we have now? Is it going to pretend for a greater appreciation for online or could it even go in the opposite direction? Faculty who are simply teaching remotely but seeing some deficiencies uh, compared to their residential experience. So Darby, I'm going to start with you and our uh, going around for the last time. Thanks. Uh, to answer your direct question, I hope that it does signal that we're going to have more online education. Uh, I am the Dean of an Access and Opportunity School, and I really think that online and hybrid is the new evening. It is the way to give access in a very meaningful way. Um, a couple of other points. Uh, I know that a lot of people are planning extra things for their students this summer. Um, what I heard from Megan was exciting. If you're a member of a Scribes Institutional School, if you're just interested, I have developed the Dean's Summer Associate of Training Academy. It's a 10-week synchronous program on Fridays for students. There are different topics. I've guest speakers ranging from how do you get an assignment and complete an assignment and deal with a partner. What if a partner or supervisor asks you to do something unethical, um, learning about settlement agreements. If you're interested in this, I'm glad to offer your school a couple of seats in this because guess what? We can scale it. It's on Zoom. And then I just finished a, a graduate online graduation speech for my students and I was thinking about it. It's like students are really getting great legal skills from what we're going through. Adaptable performance, learning to deal with ambiguity in a meaningful way and learning to focus on the big picture and what really matters. We've got to sweat the details, but understanding that we're connected as humans and focusing on people's lives and um, our love for each other is really more important. So if you, you haven't thought about talking to your students and graduates about that, I would suggest talking to them about the lessons learned so that they're going to have tools that we didn't have going through a similar situation. Thank you. Great message. Thank you. John, what does uh, online education this spring mean for the future? It's a, it's a watershed moment. Uh, it allows us, uh, I, I had a little joke with you about, uh, uh, unfortunately, what we will see is kind of like the story when USC went to play Alabama in, in the late 70s, how that changed a lot of things in, in Alabama about football. And other people have to figure out what I mean by that. But, but the point is, is that we have to prepare our graduates for the world that they will face now going forward. And this is all part of a process where we have to make sure that our graduates are technologically proficient. They will not be able to practice law in the future without being technologically proficient. And so the very way we practice law, the very way we offer services to our clients, the very way we solve access to justice issues, and the very way that we are service to the communities that we live in have now been changed. And technology is going to affect everything we do. So now this is what we have to prepare our students to be able to do it. It would be educational malpractice not to prepare them. Yeah. Thank you, John. So many times we divorce the, the technology platform from thinking about what we're really teaching in terms of the use of technology. So thank you for reminding us of that great lesson. Aaron? I, I, um, I appreciated your point about faculty attitude because for us, what the future looks like um, at Florida State turns on what the faculty ultimately think. And I think we've got one 
group of faculty of a group that's resistant to change in general that just think it's time to retire even going through next year is more than more than they're sure they want to try to uh, navigate we've got another group of faculty um also small though um or i wonder if we'll ever see them again um that is they've really taken to the online environment they've got some personal challenges and um and and they figured out ways to have all the engagement they want and work with their students um it's the third group uh, which is probably a majority of our faculty are faculty that have um so far treated the circumstances um as one that enables an opportunity for creativity. And I think that's um, that's the group that we can make the most in, we can make the most influence on as deans, right? Do we provide the kind of support and ideas that have this faculty comfortable and excited about this new space and how to bring it, carry it forward uh, into the world um, or, or not? Um, so that's the group I think we should focus on as faculty and not worry about either of the extremes. Yeah, thank you. That's a great way of analyzing it. And, and it's not monolithic. There are groups within faculties that have different views of this. And Megan, the final word? That's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I have been starting to see some articles coming out about, you know, like online education is just sort of swinging the other direction, right? Saying that um, this is, you know, it's everyone's getting Zoom fatigue and nobody, you know, we, we just want to be face face to face is so much better. But, you know, it reminded me of I grew up in a small town and there was this uh, older woman I knew when I was growing up. And she told she used to tell this story about how, um, you know, she she was driving her car in traffic one time and she got cut off. And then she said, I'm just never going to drive again. And so after that, you know, her husband drove her to the grocery store and, and um, she really didn't drive again. And I think that that this kind of experience is not indicative, whether it's, you know, in, when we're thinking about in remote um, emergency contingency planning, that's a very different thing from well thought out online education. And as we move toward um, ways to to think about it through the summer, what's going to happen is that even our remote, our, our emergency remote planning is kind of going to become much better because we're all realizing that, that this is just a tool. This is like a form of, of transportation, something that, that fits in our pedagogical box, that we can do some great things to, to, um, toward the end of, of learning and effective learning. I think that one of the things that this experience has made me realize and to really think about is just how critical lawyers are to the basic structure of civil society. Lawyers are so important and they protect vulnerable populations. And, um, and, and we as leaders in legal education are also doing something important because we are training the next generation of, of lawyers who are going to um, help people that really need it. And, Situations like this make that more apparent to me than ever before. So even while I'm sitting here, you know, I look like I'm in front of the school, but if you saw where I really am, I'm just hoping that my seven-year-old doesn't walk in at the same time. Um, you know, in that context, it's easy to get lost, but the truth is that every single person on this call today and participating in the webinar cares and it plays a role in the future of legal education. And that's a really exciting place to be in. Thank you. Just great, great inspirational closing remarks. And thank you, Deans. And Kelly, I'll turn it over to you for our closing. Thank you, Ken. And uh, it is great to hear from each of you, Deans. And I really thank you. When I think about encouraging all those candidates to apply to law school, I know why, because they're going to be in your good hands. And uh, the way you've tackled this time is admirable and I really applaud your commitments to excellence and to equity and to all that makes legal education great. So thanks so much for being with us today. And on that note about equity, I want to let everyone know that next month we're tackling the topic of accessibility and law and the future of that. And our next show is on May 20th, same time, four o'clock Eastern. And uh, this topic of accessibility is really critical now more than ever as we've all had to move so quickly to this new environment. 
So I hope viewers that you'll join us next month on May 20th at four o'clock for Live with Kelly and Ken. And in the meantime, again, deans, thank each and all of you. You're terrific. And uh, we applaud your leadership and thank you for your time. We'll see everyone next month. Thanks for being with Kelly and Ken today. Thank you.